I feel strongly that in office systems we want to avoid what I call office automation. It's too easy to leap out there and say, oh, well, here's something I can automate, something like uh, appointment schedules or so on. You can automate that. That's not where it's at. Where it's at is providing really smooth tools so people can use them in a very natural way. One of the targets was to make an instrument that not only would, was powerful enough to do uh, the editorial functions that were required and preserve the original manuscript and not destroy the author's work and, and uh, all the very necessary things in editing, uh, but be very easy to operate. Well, Ginn was very concerned about how much money the system would save them and how it would impact the procedures, the administrative procedures that they used to put out a book. And they asked us what the impact would be, but we told them that we couldn't answer that because we had no idea what the procedures really were. We had sort of a, an idea of what we thought they were, but it turned out that we were wrong. They showed us what they called a checklist, which had on the order of 30 to 50 steps, I forget. And it described all the various steps necessary from the time that a book is accepted for publication till the time that it's actually printed. One of the problems that had been in the project was the fact that Ginn was in Lexington, Massachusetts, and Park was in Palo Alto, California, and those two places are 3,000 miles apart. There was another distance also, and that was the distance between people. Park is staffed by computer scientists, and Ginn is staffed by editors and, and graphics personnel. I was brought in to try and bridge that gap. I think it is, uh, it is more dramatic uh, to look at, and for that reason you see more than when you're, when you're on the flat of your desk. Well, for about four years now, uh, Xerox and Park in particular have been involved in research into advanced office systems. Uh, what I mean by advanced office systems is a broad range of capability in the office to help people in communications as well as the production of paper documents. Uh, we've been, we have had going at Park a program uh, developing an experimental system for use here with a number of users at Park. That's called the Polis program. Uh, basically, it, uh, well, so part of the fundamental philosophy is the use of soft displays, in other words, a television display that presents information that can rapidly change on the screen, and some very smooth interactive tools for the user to communicate with that screen and the computer system behind it that holds and manipulates the information. Uh, so I say that's been going on at Park for about four years, and at the same time, uh, Ginn and Company, that's a part of Xerox, has been looking around at the uh, state of the art in computer-aided systems for book publishing. Uh, they have to do that really to stay up with the, with the world, since uh, that sort of technology is coming on very fast, everything from computer typesetting right back up to editing of the author's manuscript. Uh, about uh, two years ago, or a year and a half ago, it became apparent that we had reached a state in the Polis development uh, where we could cooperate with Ginn and actually spin off a piece of the Polis work to develop a system for use at Ginn, specifically for book publishing. Uh, it looked like a great opportunity to work with some editors who had real-life problems and give us a lot of feedback in developing the user interface, which I think is the critically important part of a system of this nature, and at the same time provide them a system that would really uh, set them well along the road towards computer editing. And that, as I say, about a year and a half ago was really the birth of the system that we now call Gypsy, a system for text editing and page, format, page formatting for book publishing. Well, when we receive a manuscript, um, any editor, um, as well as someone in social science as I am, 
uh, we'll review the, edit, the manuscript for um, general problems. And we usually go through a revision before I would do the kind of detailed editing that uh, would involve uh, retyping the manuscript uh, in any form. At that stage, I would uh, start uh, marking up the manuscript um, in pencil, so uh, I still have the right to change my mind. And as I finish, say, a section, I would hand it to my secretary to type. And because I am editing in detail for the first time, it's quite often possible that I miss small things while I am trying to solve what are the relatively large remaining problems of the manuscript. So when she types it, uh, I get the manuscript back again. She would copy edit it uh, for her own typos, um, which are not many, but even the best secretary makes them. I would copy edit it for her typos, and then I would read it again for the small points, which. Uh, almost always uh, you have missed a few. Um, at that stage uh, there may be a few places that will require retyping again. Then the manuscript would be sent out to the authors for a final check and almost always uh, the authors have some additional ideas. They may still, if I am arguing with them over a point, uh, I may have put in something that uh, I wanted them to put in and they didn't put in. And they may agree, but they will want to put it in their own words. So they will revise it again. So I'll get a manuscript back that will, I will edit their editing of my editing. And uh, there will be sections that uh, my secretary will type again. And at that stage, uh, the manuscript will go to the authors for a final check uh, before it's turned over to, to graphics to be designed and to go into a design of type and page arrangement. And in that case, hopefully, because of the cost of manufacturing, the cost of composition, the authors and I, as the editor, uh, once the manuscript is released to graphics, we must make no more changes on it. The type of change that would be made from there on, hopefully, would be changes for uh, adjustment to page proof, to pages, uh, cross-references, lengths, problems that have to deal with getting the right amount of, of material on a page or worrying about the looks of a page because a widow falls at the top of the line. Yes, that. It's very bad. Just put that. Yeah, right. There. Right, right. And this is just a right. runoff. Do the, both of these go with study skills? Yeah. And that's the last page. No, oh, I, I, I. When we started working at Park on uh, computer soft display word processors, many of us had a lot of background in that area but the systems we had worked on in the past were designed for computer experts. And it became obvious that when we came to work at PARC that the systems we were going to build were going to be used by computer novices, people in offices, editors at GIN. So in order to get some notion of the kind of user interface that would work for those people, we performed some experiments. In one experiment, we presented a novice user with a terminal that had nothing on the screen, had a keyboard and a pointing device. And we said, pretend that there's text on the screen and you would like to make certain corrections to it. What would you like this magic box to do? So they would say, well, I'll point at the text and that I want to delete and then I'll hit the delete button or something like that. Or I'll point where I want to type and then I'll start typing. And they would go through a scenario of what they would like to do. It sounded very simple, but in fact was quite different from the kind of command languages that we had in the systems we had been building. So we then built an experimental text editor that was based on those experiments, and secretaries here tried it out, 
and then some people from Gin came and they tried it out. And they all said that, yes, that was the kind of system they would like to have. Now, this was a very simple editor. It didn't have the flexibility and the power that was needed to do a completely general text processing application or to do what Gin needed. But we had established criteria that we could use to judge any kind of design that we came up with for the full system. One of the criteria was that someone should be able to sit down and learn the basics of the system in just a few minutes and in less than a day become fairly proficient at the use of the system. Another was that there shouldn't be a lot of commands required to do editing, that we'd like to get by with as few commands as possible. Another was that we didn't want to have what are called modes. A mode is where you hit a certain key and what it does, what the action of that key does depends on the previous key that you hit. So for example, if you get into an insert mode, then the keys that you type will insert text, while if you get into an overtype mode or a substitute mode, they will do something else. And we wanted to avoid modes in the system. So we set up these general design criteria. Now, it wasn't until Gin hired Timothy Ma, who is a systems scientist, and sent Timothy here to work with us, that we actually started to implement the system. I joined the project after being hired by Darwin Newton, who is an executive editor at Gin, and immediately came out to Park. At that point, there weren't very many decisions that have been made as re regarding the implementation of the, of the proposed system. One of the things that I did the first month or two months while I was here was just wander around and get to know people and look at the different systems that have been put together here that might be possible building blocks for us to use in building the system for GIN. We took a small personal computer that had been developed and built at Park and the system software that had been written for that machine, which included a text editor, and begin, began to implement the GIN system. The way we went about this was to take the text editor and essentially reprogram the user interface. There were two reasons why we wanted to do that. One was because the user interface, as it was set out at that time, we didn't feel was suitable for naive users, which were the kind of users we were addressing at GIN. The other thing we knew was that we wanted to have a, an environment, a system with which we could work in which it was possible to experiment with user interfaces and try a lot of them. On the one hand, we would like to have this dynamic medium which really revolutionizes the way people are able to deal with information and to design things. On the other hand, we'll never sell this to anyone if it seems like a mysterious foreign machine. So we need to come up with something that they can relate to, something they can relate to the way they've been operating before. One of the main principles, which I think is coming out of this now, is just the importance of, of working with the users, trying to understand the way in which they work, such that when we present them with something, it's just not, it's not totally incomprehensible to them. They have some points of reference to that system, perhaps because we take terms like cut and paste that they're familiar with, and kind of model those in what we build for them. The system that Park is building for GIN has two main parts to it. There's the page layout system, which we have just started to implement. And there's Gypsy, which is used for preparing the text of a book without any concern for the way the pages will look. So Gypsy is really a kind of specialized soft display word processing system. And page layout has to be done on a display because of the two-dimensionality. Word processing could be done on a typewriter-like device, but we, we felt very strongly that it should be done on a two-dimensional display so that the operator could see at all times just what the text looks like without having to retype it after making a correction. The hardware for the Gypsy system consists of a small personal computer, a video display screen, a keyboard, a five key key set, a three button mouse pointing device, and a hard copy printer. 
The way I would usually introduce this equipment to inexperienced computer users, such as the editorial staff at GIN, is to describe the computer as being analogous to an electronic filing cabinet. This special filing cabinet has in it a drawer into which we can place a disk cassette. The disk cassettes contain the files and documents with which we will be working. The video display screen, keyboard, keyset, and mouse comprise what is called a video typewriter. On this special kind of typewriter, the text we're working with is displayed upon the screen rather than upon paper, and characters typed at the keyboard will be seen upon that screen again rather than upon paper. With the disk cassette loaded, we can now start using the system. This is the first view a user would have of Gypsy upon starting the system. You will notice here on the display a double T-shaped cursor. I can move this mouse cursor around the screen by moving the mouse itself on the table. This provides for a very convenient way of pointing at text on the display. Initially, we see the directory, which has a table of contents, and pages, which contain information about the documents stored on the disk cassette. I can turn to a page by moving the mouse button over the special command word turn and then pressing the top button on the mouse. I can bring a document from the electronic filing cabinet to the video typewriter by invoking the special command word fetch. We can now see that document. I can bring different parts of that document into view by using the two scroll keys on the key set. One, which is marked up, will scroll the document through the text window, which is delineated by these thick black lines. The other, marked down, will bring the document down through the window. I can also jump to the very end of the document. You will notice here on the display the flashing carrot symbol. Characters typed on the keyboard will be inserted in the document at the point marked by the carrot. If I make a mistake while typing, as I did then, I can use the backspace key to strike out the miskeyed character. I can also type boldface characters. and italicize characters. You will notice that there wasn't enough room on this line for the word obvious. In that case, Gypsy picked up the whole word and moved it down to the next line. Using the mouse, I can reposition the carrot, for instance, to just before the word was, and insert text at that point. I can delete text by first drawing through it with the mouse and then pressing the cut key on the key set. Text that is cut falls into the wastebasket, which is the area below the bottom black line. Text in the wastebasket can be pasted back into the main document at the point marked by the carrot by depressing the paste key on the key set. I can move text by first cutting it to the wastebasket, then repositioning the carrot to the new place where I wish to put it, then pasting it back in at that place. When I'm satisfied with the editing changes I have made to the document, I can file it back in the electronic filing cabinet by invoking the special command word, file. With the capabilities to type text onto the screen, edit it using the cut and paste operations, and then save it on a disk cassette, documents can be initially typed and then edited with a minimum, with a minimum amount of effort and retyping. These basic operations can be easily learned in less than two hours. There are, of course, more sophisticated features. 
For instance, I can enlarge the window, then make a new one, and bring into that new window a completely different document. I could then take a paragraph from the first document and copy that into the second. Finally, to obtain a copy of the document I was initially editing, I can go back to the beginning of that document, I can invoke the printer command, select some printer options, and finally start the printer to cause a hard copy to be produced. This printer is not a particularly satisfactory device. It is a fairly slow and inflexible piece of equipment. In the near future, and especially when we start working on the page layout aspects of Gypsy, we expect to use an improved printing facility which is being developed here, and also a commercially available typesetter. I think the two most in, uh, unique things about this system are its ease of operation. Uh, and when I say ease of operation, not only the physical operator ease, but the powerful things it can do with great ease. And then the second one is the retention of uh, materials that uh, are, can be retrieved and re-entered into the document. Uh, I don't think I have even come anywhere near identifying the potential of the system. I think in very short order, uh, the people that have the opportunity to use it will find that uh, it will tremendously enhance their ability to create better documents uh, and make them a producer of better materials. I think that one of the problems that we have these days as editors is that we're working on tighter time schedules. And um, if you don't have any break from what you have done, uh, you tend to take it take for granted what you have done. But if I have a if I have to look at it clean all the time, it's almost as if I've had a week or so away from the manuscript and I'm coming back and seeing it all over again. And I in that way, I don't even see that I have done something and I suspect that I'll be more critical. I will be very surprised if we don't approach somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty five percent time saving and in the publishing business, time saving their dollars. And um, so I, I look for close to 25% reduction in the editorial costs of the products, mostly in terms of time, yeah. plus the ability to get into the marketplace more rapidly. We've learned how to build a really good editor. That's, that's very clear. You know, the, the Gypsy editor is, uh, I think, without doubt, the smoothest computer editor that, that there is anywhere. And Larry has done just an outstanding job in, in working with the users and developing that. That's the major thing we've learned from it. Mm -hmm. uh, we've learned in the process how to go about designing systems like that. The whole process of interaction that took place between Larry and editors at Ginn, between Larry and test subjects that he had here, uh, is really an example of how you go about designing things like this. Yes, I think we learned that a lot of the more sophisticated concepts that we learn in the methodology of developing software are not well carried over to the problem of good user interfaces for non-computer experts. That the technique we're used to of providing more and more and more features to a system when we're doing a system for computer scientists is probably the worst possible approach to use when designing a system for non-computer experts. That really what should be done is to come up with the absolute minimum number of facilities that just do the job, because that will result in the least confusion, the minimum learning time, and actually the most simple implementation of the product, which means that it'll be more reliable. To me, the real payoff in the uh, work that we've done on Gypsy is not necessarily in systems for book publishers. Uh, while, uh, while we can do a very good job on that, the real payoff is going to be the implications that systems like Gypsy have in office systems of the future. Uh, 
Gypsy is going to, while its present system doesn't have page layout capabilities, uh, that will be in the system by the end of the summer, mm -hmm. giving the user the ability to sit down and format a page on the screen, choosing typefaces, laying out uh, spaces for pictures, and essentially create the page as a work of art instead of as, a, as a, the text only. Mm -hmm. uh, when you add that capability to a, an office system, and essentially put in the hands of the average office worker the ability to create a page that not only contains words, but is beautiful to look at, with typefaces, with illustrations, and everything, you've really made a tremendous impact on the office. People use that because they like to. You know, people like to produce things that look good. It's an extension of their ego, and they want to do it. And if you really provide that capability, it's going to have a tremendous impact, I think. On the average office use uh, for producing memos that look good, such as the ones we do around here on the systems we have, uh, right on to the central reproduction department, where there's a real value, you know. People can attach value in producing reports and proposals that have that kind of artistic quality that you associate with books, for example. Although the printing process itself may not be that good, at least the layout is going to have a, an element of quality that people want. And that's where the payoff is going to be. There's a lot of money in that market, I think.